Welcome to the Culture and Sports Podcast, where we have discussions about how leadership and organizational culture impact organizational success, team and athlete performance, and the short and long-term mental, physical, and emotional health of athletes. The Culture and Sports Podcast is brought to you by Culture and Sports. Culture and Sports helps sports organizations, teams, coaches, support and front office staff, and athletes understand the importance of leadership and organizational culture and its direct impact to success. I'm Dr. Jeremy Piasecki, and this is the Culture and Sports Podcast. I would like to introduce you to Ben Cacciardi. He is the founder of Soccer Without Borders. Ben holds a master's degree in education from Lehigh University and has studied conflict resolution, interactive theater, team building, and methods of teaching mindfulness practices to youth. In 2015, Ben was named a Champion of Change by President Barack Obama for World Refugee Day, an award that reflects his unique expertise in the field of refugee integration and youth development. In addition to this work with Soccer Without Borders, Ben is an award-winning poet. It's a sincere pleasure to have you on today, Ben. Uh, Please tell us a little bit about your sports journey. Yeah, so uh, I grew up in San Francisco, California, and I, you know, in the early days, I loved uh, all sports. Baseball was probably my first favorite sport, Um, and then played all sports until about eighth grade, and once I got to high school, um, sort of started to specialize more in soccer. I guess there's, Mm -hmm. I made the Olympic Development Program, and that sort of was encouraged to specialize in, in terms of, you know, really being able to advance, which... I know there's a lot of um, varying opinions about if that's a good idea or not, but at the time, I, I really I really loved soccer. Uh, continued to play through high school and then collegiately at Lehigh University. And then I played semi-professionally for a little while with a team called the San Francisco Seals back here in the Bay Area. Um, and it was around that time, kind of after completing my master's degree and after, um, after you know, while still playing on the San Francisco Seals that... Um, we, I started Soccer Without Borders, and uh, I've been doing that for the last, uh, you know, almost 18 years now. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's that's a little bit about my sports journey. So let's talk a little bit more of how you got involved in Soccer Without Borders. I mean, what I mean by that is you just didn't wake up one day and say, oh, I'm going to start this international organization. So can you talk a little bit about how this magic happened? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So... I, I mean, one thing that's kind of unique about Soccer Without Borders is it was started by young people. So I was I was 22 uh, when the organization started, and just um, I had a job at the I had a got a scholarship to stay and do a free master's degree at Lehigh, and I, mm-hmm. I also had a work study job in the library, and I worked in this part of the library where nobody would ever come, so um, I would use I used that time basically. I read a book called How to Form a Nonprofit Organization uh, by a company called Nolo Press. And I just followed mm-hmm. it literally to a T, um, kind of having the idea of Soccer Without Borders um, had been connected to you know a lot of my life experience um, as a, someone who loves soccer and someone who grew up in San Francisco uh, as part of the large immigrant community here. Um, and as someone who I, I did a lot of kind of like summer jobs at a community center in the Mission District of San Francisco. Um, and have been exposed to sort of the way that sport can be used as a tool for community development, how sport can mm-hmm. be used for youth development, and how youth who don't have opportunities um, can really thrive when given opportunities, and how sport can really encourage them um, to, you know, to make to make healthy decisions. So that that was all stuff that I had been exposed to, and I kind of wanted to, you know, wanted to put something together. I didn't see something that was exactly what I had in mind. I think there was also a high degree of, um, you know, naivete on my part of of what it actually means to start an organization and you know what the what the follow through would be, um, but I think that that probably worked to my benefit in some ways um, and to the benefit of the organization. Just rather than you know needing everything to be totally thought through and having a business plan and having it everything exactly dialed in, I think there was a real a real sense of. Um, a clarity of the the purpose of the organization and a, and a clarity of what was most important and a, an emphasis on service. And mm-hmm. those things were all really clear at the beginning, even if a lot of the kind of other piece of it um, 
in terms of how it would be funded or how it would be staffed and how we would report everything successfully. All of those things were, were you know, were not as dialed in, but that's all stuff that you can learn. Um, and what we started seeing was that, um, you know, the first, back in, in 2006, when we first started doing programming, that there was just such an interest in the work um, that there was a real demand from the youth in the communities that we were working in, thinking about Oakland. Um, we started the Refugee Community Soccer Camp. It's an all-volunteer effort. Um, the first day we had 20 kids, uh, next day 30 kids, 40 kids. Um, and we were working in partnership with an organization called the International Rescue Committee, which does refugee resettlement, um, helps families who have been, you know, recently arrived uh, to the United States to find housing, to find work. So tell me a little bit more about what Soccer Without Borders does in their day to day and overall around the world. Yeah. Uh, so Soccer Without Borders, uh, we have been working for the last 18 years and over time have really kind of refined what we see as the program model. Um, and it, it basically revolves around three activities uh, or, you know, three activity areas that include several things. But essentially, we provide free year round uh, soccer, educational and community building program for mm-hmm. newcomer youth um, and uh, and girls who are who are from traditionally underserved backgrounds. So we really have a focus on uh, providing high quality soccer educational and community building program to youth who are excluded from traditional sports programming. Um, in the U.S., our focus is really on youth who have been displaced um, and who have who have had to leave their home country for a variety of different reasons, and are <clears throat> uh, are arriving to to. Um, arriving to the U.S. having experienced uh, often some traumatic situation which forced them to leave, and then similarly a difficult situation on the immigration journey itself. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, the focus for us is really around how can we how can we create a team where they will feel um, connected, where they will feel like they have a peer group, where they will feel like they have positive adult mentors, and we sort of start with soccer and their interest in soccer as a way of establishing those connections. And then over time, um, we, we layer in additional educational support, which looks like both academic support, but also a lot of socio-emotional learning. Um, right now we're, we're working here in Oakland with a psychologist who's on staff as a behavioral health specialist, um, mm-hmm. training our staff to, uh, to implement something that we're calling meet me on the pitch, which is, a whole behavioral health program using the metaphor of soccer as a way to help young people who are really, you know, who are basically many of them who are not coming to school or who are, you know, who are, have very few positive connections to kind of re-engage and um, apply some of the things they've learned through soccer to their their other life. Um, mm-hmm. And um, and then, you know, finally with the community building piece, that looks a lot like, you know, having team trips to uh, go watch professional games or camping trips or hiking trips or uh, college visits, um, having informal time, recognizing that that's a huge piece of what um, what young people in underserved communities don't get access to. And mm-hmm. we do sort of think about those three activities as, you know, it starts sort of soccer at the bottom of the funnel and then education and community building come in more and more as time goes on and as those connections are established as a way of really deepening the impact um so that the idea is is you know is really not that um that soccer will be the you know the end it's it's much more the the means to a deeper relationship which can um Mm -hmm. can have you know can have beneficial impacts in you know in, in profound ways for the students that we work with um and currently we we have programs um we have six hubs so four of those are in the u.s um in oakland Mm -hmm. california denver and greeley colorado uh, baltimore maryland and boston massachusetts um and then two internationally in granada nicaragua and kampala uganda and we also have sort of a seventh hub something called soccer without borders assist which is where we're we're leveraging a lot of the things that we've learned best practices the program model uh some trainings that we provide for our internal staff and we're trying to provide those to other organizations that are doing great work Mm -hmm. um and can, um, you know, could benefit from some some additional information, um, and some some smaller organizations, some larger organizations, uh, trying to kind of be able to say yes when groups reach out to us 
um, we're not necessarily able to start a new hub, but we can hopefully share whatever we can um, from the 18 years that we've been doing this work, both about programming side, but also sometime around organizational strategy and you know how to go from an all-volunteer organization to this year we have, I think, a $6 million budget, which was, definitely was never the plan. Um, you know, mm -hmm. not articulated the plan, but it's been, um, you know, it's, or it's evolved very organically to get to that stage based on demand from the communities and the youth that we serve. No, that's, that's awesome and beautiful all at the same time. Um, now you just didn't show up one day, just like you didn't come up with soccer without borders one day and have a $6 million budget annual budget a year for a nonprofit. Uh, but just, just like that, you didn't just automatically wake up or you were born with a bunch of positive leadership, um, you know, within you. So can you tell me a little bit more about who was instrumental in um, in your growth, whether it was as an athlete or as an adult, um, you know, on the leadership side or, who, uh, you know, whether it was who and what that impact was? Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. I think... Um... I think, I mean, I'm, I'm really grateful to so many coaches I had, but I, I think I also saw a, a lot of limitations with the traditional sports model um, mm -hmm. in the sense that I think part of what was inspiring to me about starting Soccer Without Borders was kind of the unwillingness to, to recognize that sport touches on things beyond, beyond the field. And mm -hmm. I think there was a lot of things I would see from my teammates, comments that were made. I grew up in San Francisco. Um, my sister was, was, is, was queer. My, my mom is also queer. Um, and there was lots of homophobic comments that were made, for example, all the time, just like this is normal. And never once did I hear a coach address that or, or, to, or, or ask people to, you know, to consider what that, what that might mean. Um, there was a lot of times when I feel like there was, there was, you know, behaviors that myself or our teammates would, would do that. I think if we'd gotten some, some firmer, direction around that we could have um you know it could have been it could have made a huge impact for us because soccer was mm -hmm. so everybody loved being part of the team so much and and it's not to say you know that there were so many positive things i also learned from those 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 coaches and experiences but there was a lot of times when i felt like there was a limitation about what people saw as the role of a team and i thought that by broadening that out that could really could be really impactful, especially for youth that don't have a lot of mentors or, or other positive outlets. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to frame the question in the negative. I, I would say, I would say a lot of what Soccer Without Borders has been response to is things that I, I didn't see, that I didn't see um, mm -hmm. being modeled in those, in those days and then wanting to have that kind of a space. Um, and I think, you know, for me personally, being able to stay in the work, I think the main thing that um, has had, has enabled me to kind of keep a positive mindset around it all is, is having like an active meditation practice. And, um, I think really allowing me to have an introspective practice, uh, that allows me to kind of be more self-aware about how I'm showing up into spaces and how I'm making space for other people and how, you know, for me being a good leader is, is being consistent and reliable and, and encouraging others to, to be able to do, to take on, to kind of grow and take on more of the responsibilities and not, not have to do that. Not, not the sense that like, it has to be your way. It has to be me who's doing it. Um, and I think that for me, the, the thing that has most encourages me to do that is, is my, my meditation practice and kind of having the mm -hmm. sense of like, um, a practice of non-attachment, a practice of, um, you know, of, of sort of looking at things as, you know, not static, um, as needing to adapt to what's happening. Um, that's kind of the fundamental, that's sort of the fundamental thing of what, of what a meditation practice asked of you. And I think that has served me really well uh, to be able to stay, both well, to stay in this work that is of, often really tough. Like I think, you know, we focus a lot about, you know, on the, on the positives, but there, there's been a lot of really hard things in terms of families I've been close to experiencing hardship and going through that with them, uh, setbacks with hard decisions, around the organization um, and, you know, to be able to stay kind of focused on what is important and what is at the heart of that um, and what's the heart of the organization has been, has been an important mm -hmm. practice through the years. So I would say that that has been the kind of guiding more so than any person or book or mentor 
uh, that has, for, for me personally, that has been the most important thing. Well, can you dive deeper into uh, how you got into meditation practices and how you implement it every day, whether it's on your own or with groups? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I, I first started deeply, like seriously meditating when I was, uh, when I was 22, my sister passed away and it was pretty unexpected. Um, and, um, shortly after that, I was kind of trying to process my own grief and started doing some reading and, um, came across a book called the Tibetan book of living and dying. And something it said in that book was like some, one of the most important things we can do as people is to prepare the mind to die, which I know can sound really intense. And, and, um, at 22, I, it, I was nowhere, that was nowhere close to to where I was coming from. I was playing soccer. I was going out, I was having fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, but something about, something about that really spoke to me. And uh, the idea of being able to let go and being able to be, um, you know, really being able to, to be in the world in a way that you're not clinging so much to everything can, can feel really freeing. Um, And after that, I, I was just sort of inspired intellectually by that. And then I went, some, some friends had gone, gone to a 10 day silent retreat and you just go for 10 days and, and, um, and you are with yourself and you wake up at four 30 and you meditate for, you know, 10, 11 hours a day and a lot comes up and you're sort of processing yourself. Um, so I kind of jumped into the deep end around it. And then after, you know, this sort of the, the idea of going on that long retreat is to learn the practice, you know, to be able to, to meditate so that you do it day to day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so I, I have a daily practice where I, I sit, you know, either used to be in the morning, but now I have a young daughter. So now it's in the evening. Um, and, um, and then I've continued to go every year, once or twice a year for 10 days or sometimes 20 days, uh, a long period of time when there's no phones, there's no talking, there's no internet, there's no anything. You're just, you're just there observing yourself, observing the way your mind works, kind of following the way the practice works. And I feel like every time I've come out of that, I get so much insight about um, myself, but also about the work, Mm -hmm. about the organization, about what needs to happen, um, you know, about why things maybe aren't working, what what could be, what could be better. Um, I think sometimes we have especially in this day and age, we have so much input, so much saturation that it's hard to digest. And sometimes we get overwhelmed. And I think kind of stepping back and allowing things to come to us and um, allowing there to be more space and allowing there to be less really allows us to be more clear about what we, what we should, what, what the best course of action is in any particular case. Um, And I think it also helps me keep an open heart, which with this work is so key. I mean, I, I, for a long time, I was on the field. I had multiple teams. I was leading circles with kids. I was doing that work for 15 years. And I really think having like a big part of meditation is also about cultivating compassion. Uh, It's about understanding the mind. It's also about cultivating compassion, opening your heart Mm -hmm. and doing those things like with some really difficult circumstances. um, I, I think was, was also really essential. And I think has, has been essential in, in, in how I lead is, is trying to try and lead with an open heart, trying to ha- have an acknowledgement that I have a heart, you know, I think that's mm-hmm. not always part of uh, part of the conversation in organizations. And um, so how can, how can what we do be heart centered? How can I model that? How can, how can that be a part of what's happening? Um, I think all of that has been really important to start with that borders, you know, my role at Sarah That Borders, which is I'm one of many other people who have, have, you know, have, have led the organization and, and, you know, who, uh, who the organization would not exist without. I'm the founder, but I'm I'm definitely, I don't think of myself as the only founder. I think there's many people that have brought so much to it and brought things that I would have never been able to, you know, think about or understand or know. Um, So, yeah, I guess I think that the, that, when you have that connection between uh spiritual life and uh and what you're doing professionally or or when there's a when there's a connection like it you know an ability to acknowledge 
one's inner world and that there's space for that, that that can show up. Um, I think that that allows people to stay in, in this kind of work, which doesn't pay a lot and which is hard and which, you know, our staff work long hours and they, they work in suboptimal facilities. They work with, they have to drive the car full of soccer balls and shin guards and we don't, we have not ever matching stuff all the time and it's all, you know, we're all figuring out how, how, you know, how to make it all work. And the way that that makes sense as a career is, is if, if you feel like you're on a deeper level, you're, you're doing something that really matters and you're, you're really, you're impacting youth and you're, you're creating joy in situations where there's not a lot of joy and you're mm-hmm. creating love in, in situations where there's not always a lot of love. And, um, that's, that's, that's why this work is meaningful and is powerful. It's, it's not, it's so much about how we show up to that every day. And, um, I think for me, that's just been, that's, that's such a practice, you know, and I, not to say I do it every time, you know, of course I have bad days and, <laughs> right. uh, you know, situations when I, I don't, I don't show up in my best self and, um, things I, you know, things I, I regret, but I think, yeah, I think that that, there has to be an acknowledgement that that how we're how we're how we're taking care of ourselves and how we're showing up is going to impact especially with something like this mm-hmm. you know, that 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 you know where the the you know i really do feel the core of how this work is successful is the quality of the practitioner the person the coach um who is who is out there with the kids that that is the person that matters the most it is not the researcher it is not the funder it is not the philanthropist it is not the executive director it is that person and if i had anything i could say it would be like i just i've tried to i've tried to i've tried to keep that at the forefront of 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 what happens um there there's a saying that the, the person closest to the pain should be closest to the power um so thinking about the youth themselves and then the coaches themselves who are them you know there how can we center that? How can we center what their experiences um, is really an important question. And I think we don't ask that that often. Um, so anyway, I'm, I, I'm going on and on. I'll, I'll no, no, no. Be, actually, this is one of the questions I was going to ask towards the end of our, our, uh, our episode, but I might as well ask it now. So what do you do to help prioritize self-care, not only for yourself, but also for everyone at your organization? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think, um, you know, I, I think just the, for me, for sure, the thing that is most important in my self-care is, is meditation practice. Um, mm-hmm. and then I also, you know, I, I live in the Bay Area, which is an amazing place for being able to get up to nature. We're close to the Oakland Hills, the Berkeley Hills. Um, I'm also a surfer, which is something that I try to do. And, um, that makes a huge impact for me. Um, so those things all feel really essential. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it is hard. I think when you see, I mean, the, the, a lot of the stuff that we're, the context in which we're working in, there's a lot of really hard situations and mm-hmm. it's really easy to, um, you know, to understand, like, if I did a little bit more, I could help that family a little bit more. Or if I, you know, if I only had been there at that particular day, this, this fight might not have happened and to kind of push yourself to such a degree that, um, you know, it gets, it just, you know, it, it, it can really be easy for, for people because when you're seeing an impact and when you're seeing a need, um, you have to be really intentional about how you're showing up in that, in that situation to be able to stay in the work for the long term. Um, and I think I'm really proud of like, there's a lot of people in the organization that have been here for a long time. Um, and those people are those, pe- you can't, it's, it's the same with a teacher who's been in a school for 15 years. That's a beloved teacher. Like that person is worth so much in terms of mm-hmm. keeping the institutional culture, um, being, you know, knowing the families, the families, knowing them, they can access that. Um, and so I think looking at it, you know, as being patient, I think we have a real tendency with 
all nonprofit work, but especially, you know, youth development work, there's such a, show me the numbers, like, what's the impact? What, you know, oh, this isn't working. We need to change it. At the school district level, we see this all the time. Where there's a new superintendent comes in with a great idea and a year and a half goes by and it hasn't changed yet. So another person comes in and it's a year and a half and we don't give things time to, mm -hmm. to blossom. We plant all these, I think, good seeds. Like I think people have really good ideas, but it takes a long time for a tree to bear fruit. And right. if we, if we're not doing that and we're not giving things time and we're not patient with the young people in our programs, like, okay, they made a mistake. Oh, they made that same mistake. Oh, they made that same mistake. But the fourth time, they didn't do it quite as much. And the fifth time they made a different choice, mm -hmm. you know, um, that's how this, that's how I think this work, work actually, actually makes a difference. It's not, it's not, we came in, we did something for a couple of days. We had a clinic, you know, we visited the professional team and it was great. Like that's, that's not where work actually happens. It's the long-term relationships. It's the mentoring. It's, when something goes wrong, I can call you and you'll be there. And when, you know, there was a situation the other day at one of the schools we work with here in Oakland where one of our participants who's not been in the country that long and kind of in jest, wasn't really sure, said that he had a gun. And th that put the school into lockdown. Then the student left and the student, they didn't know where that student was. And they told one of our staff members who was really close with that student. And he was like, that's just a misunderstanding. I know right away that's a misunderstanding. And he was able to go find that student and talk to him. And just because they had this trust in this relationship, mm -hmm. the school could come out of lockdown, could come back to the, come, come back to the campus. And, and that's really, you know, that's really what I think of as the heart of what we do is there are students that, that I think we know our, our staff, or the head, the, the head coach knows in a deeper way than maybe any other adult other than the parents um, in in the education system, and that's because there, there. I mean, there are so many students. There are so many students, and there are constantly new students coming in. They're under resourced schools. I'm I'm really not trying to be. This is no critique of. No, teachers, of course not. Teachers, but it's an easy way for kids to to get lost and not really be uh, no close connections. Yes. Yes, exactly. No, it, it's very easy in our current system to kind of just scoot by and not really mm -hmm. be seen by someone else and not really be acknowledged by someone else. And so the more types of programs that are helping different types of kids establish those connections is what we need. And so soccer, our program is that for some kids, but there's also not for other kids. And so other programs that are doing that in different ways I think the more that we can set up, you know, that we can, that we can have that special relationship with, with somebody that, that every kid has somebody that is recognizing them and sees them and knows, oh no, that's, that's not what's really going on. Uh, that, that, that was a misunderstanding about the gun situation that wasn't, you know, and you know, that, that type of thing, I mean, that scenario can go a lot of different ways, you know? when there's not that adult, like that scenario can go. And we are reflecting on, we're reflecting on that currently, like that situation without that deep relationship or even not even deep, but like a relationship with a positive adult um, that can, you know, lead to law enforcement getting involved and all the kind of things that, you know, we've seen time and time again in the country over the last number of, you know, number of years where, where there's just a misunderstanding and a confrontation where there doesn't need to be a confrontation. Um, so anyway, that, that, you know, uh, taking it back to your question around self-care, I, I really am an advocate for trying to see this as to, for being patient with ourselves, being patient with the kids, um, trying to stay in the work for a long, a long term and, and recognizing it takes time to have an impact and to build those relationships. And I mean, we all know, what's good for self-care is working less and, you know, taking care of ourselves. And, you know, we try to create a culture, I think, but I, I do think unless you're modeling that as a leader, it it's all, we all know, we all know, but I think when we come into contact with people that are doing that and you feel that and they have something left in their tank to give you, um, 
then that becomes different. I'm, I'm a real firm believer in, in you know, uh, how being much more important than what, um, in the sense that, uh, you know, we all know the things we're supposed to do, but like, how are we showing up to doing them? And, <laughs> uh, and, and that's for myself too. Like I, there, you know, definitely there are things that I do all the time that I'm like, oh, it's probably, probably could have done that a different way. Um, mm-hmm. so yeah. So not necessarily the kid you were just referencing, um, but you know, kids in general is one of the things that, uh, not only that you're doing, but everyone at Soccer Without Borders, is it showing these kids that they're valued, you know, that people care about them? It's not just, oh, a positive adult, you know, athlete relationship, but, you know, showing that they are valued and they should have self-value, um, you know, and I'm sure it, regardless of whether they're getting it at home or not, um, I'm sure that's a very important thing that uh, Soccer Without Borders is doing. So can you explain a little bit more about that and, and what you do in that respect? Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a phrase we use a lot of, that the core thing that we do is we create belonging for, for mm-hmm. the young people in our program. And I think that that's a really a fundamental need that we all have, and especially young people, and especially young people coming out of COVID where they were isolated for multiple years and not seeing a lot of people and not getting positive affirmation. Um, and I think that that to me feels like, um, that to me feels like the most important thing, you know, that, that we can do. And practically speaking, I think there are a couple things that, you know, that we do, uh, so every one of our practices starts and practices and games starts and ends with the closing, I'm uh, sorry, starts with an opening circle and ends with the closing circle. And in the opening circle, we have something, a word of the day, which is both to help with developing vocabulary, but also sort of setting the tone for the day, something we want to work on. Um, connection, that word might be a new word, but that might also be the word that we want to focus on. So can we, can we all have a goal of setting, making one new connection today at practice and then turn to your neighbor and talk about what was the last time, what was a connection that you recently made. And then, you know, go through the practice at the, at the, op- at the closing circle, uh, there's a chance to reflect about the, the word of the day. And we also at the closing circle do something called positivity points, which, you know, we have three students who at the beginning are assigned to give out those positivity points, but they look for the students that, um, they look for the students who, uh, you know, that day we're really modeling um, effort, we're modeling uh, leadership, we're modeling connection, we're modeling all those qualities that, you know, not who played the best, although that sometimes gets the positivity point, but it sort of creates a culture within the team around recognition and support and, oh, that person saw me doing this. Like, I feel like I, they want me to be here. I, I belong here. Um, and, Um, in the aftermath of, of this incident, I was just describing my coworker who, who, who was there told me about an article where this teacher had a practice of writing down, uh, every Friday at the end of, at the end of the week, she would, she would write down, um, she would ask students like, who did you see doing a good job this week? Um, who did you, you know, who did you feel like was really, was really modeling like the behavior that I wanted to see in the classroom? And what she would do was was look for the students who never showed up. Like what what were the kids that never got that recognition? Um, and that was a student that she would that she would point to. Like what what are what are the kids that you know not the ones that are like the, everybody's seeing that they're doing great, but who are the ones who aren't getting that kind of acknowledgement or sort of maybe just sliding through and falling through the cracks? And so I think trying to bring that to the forefront of of every aspect of what we do. So, you know, um, a lot of times, and this is a particular true with the work with girls, we have to do a lot of outreach to get kids to want to try to come. And sometimes getting them, so like getting them to the field, we spend a lot of time and, 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 and energy on that, you know, cause we know once they get there that there's so, you know, just participation in sport in general, this, you know, so many proven mental health benefits and especially when you have a really intentional coach and you have a really positive space um we know that there's going to be benefits that and so a lot of what 
where we invest time is how do we get some students who are who are really socially isolated because they just came here or because they're dealing with mental health challenges or because they are, you know, for, for whatever reason, because they can't get to the field. So we really spend a lot of time thinking about get them to the field. Um, how can we, how can we, you know, how can we make sure that we're getting those who need that support to come out there? And that's, that's where it starts. Like, that's where they start to feel valued, right? To, to your questions, like, oh, you want me to be here, you know, um, you care, you care that, um, that I'm here, um, that, and that means something. Why um, do you have to put extra effort or why does Soccer Without Borders have to put an extra effort um, to get girls involved in their programs? Is it because there's not as much support for girls and their families as opposed to the boys? Like the boys can make it a little like further in sports or is it, um, you know, you know, something else that's happening in the community? What are you seeing out there and, and, and what and what is Soccer Without Borders doing to change that? Yeah, great. That's a great question. Um, so I, I think so. Primarily, we work with high school age youth and middle school age youth mm -hmm. um, in the in the U.S. Um, and as a result of that, I think a lot of the girls who are in our program are coming from places where it is not the norm for girls to play sports, mm -hmm. or there are there are just very few opportunities for them where there are where there are opportunities that. You know, there are fewer opportunities in general for an organized sport experience and then for girls, even fewer. Um, and so oftentimes we have a situation where a 16 year old girl may have never been a part of a team because that, that didn't exist in the community where she grew up or wasn't the norm. But they might be athletic and they might be interested in playing. Um, and so, you know, um, to the question of like, what what are we doing? I think first is we have we always have female identifying coaches with uh, our girls our girls participants um, and um, we do a lot of uh, a lot of outreach so we, we part a, a really essential aspect of our model is to work in partnership with schools or or other um, other agencies where youth are already you know congregating taking place and mm -hmm. we do a lot of outreach we go to students who you know we 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 reach out to girls to invite them to come to try it. Um, once there are some girls in the program, we encourage them to invite their friends to try it and to get to get out and be involved. Um, when there are situations where we have, you know, cultural barriers at home, um, to you know that there might not be support from the parents to play, we try to do home visits uh, and usually with somebody who speaks the parents' language with the coach or if that coach speaks the language or another staff member who speaks the language um, to be able to connect and build those bridges. Um, and I think that, um, you know, I think there's also just at the competitive level, I think the other thing that we've been doing in Oakland in particular, one of the things we struggled with was that because a lot of our girls were newer to you know, the competitive aspect, we were participating in leagues against girls where everybody had been playing for a long time. And that is really, it's really hard to lose all the time by a, a large margin. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we did was we, we actually made our own league um, for high school age girls who are newer to sports and where the, the system can be much like, we don't have to have player cards for every player if mm -hmm. a girl doesn't have shin guards, she can still participate. We can find her shin guards. Um, if they don't have matching socks that they don't get made to feel bad. If they have piercings that were put in at birth in their culture, they're not going to be told that they can't play unless they tape it. And all these things, which is, which was our experience in these other leagues and which ended up with a lot of girls not feeling, um, mm -hmm. you know, like they belonged. And so it's a lot about, so in summary, I would say all female staff reaching out and not assuming because a girl isn't playing that she wouldn't want to play, like making that possible mm -hmm. and then creating skill level appropriate, um, skill level appropriate competition where it is competitive and people are trying and winning and all those great things about sport, but where there's also, you know, the referee can show you how to do something twice um, as opposed to making you feel like, you know, it's a red card. And then the last thing I'll say is <laughs> trans transportation is, is, um, 
is a really essential part. So uh, especially just safety wise um, for a lot of our girls, uh, one of the main reasons that parents sometimes have hesitation is not because they don't believe they should be playing soccer. It's because they don't feel comfortable with them getting around safely um, in the neighborhoods where they live. And so, you know, we build in a transportation plan into our staff time. And um, I really think about it like this, like a lot of times we think about if we just create the opportunity, people like uh, kids will come and that's true to an extent, but if you really want to reach youth who aren't currently being served by the traditional, you know, that aren't going to club teams that aren't playing on their school teams that aren't doing other things, there needs to be just as much emphasis on the before, what are we doing to build relationships and create outreach and, and invite and, and and create the context and get them there, then while they're there, the quality of the experience and the after, following up, making sure they what went well, making sure they got home safely, making sure their parents are understanding, making sure they know what's coming next. All three of those stages need to be given equal weight. And I think mm-hmm. typically we just put that middle section, we just say, that's everything. You know, if we do that well, then everything else will right. work out. But really, if you want to if you want to reach youth who are truly not being served, uh, those those three stages of it um, really need to be considered and given given their proper uh, their proper due. So, would you say that um, recruiting girls is the hardest function, or removing the barriers for those girls to play? Um, in in your model that you're currently using? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think it probably dep- depends place to place. Um, I think I would say it's the barriers more so than the, than the recruitment, though. I do think mm-hmm. there are girls who are interested in playing, um, but that... The, but they the don't see a way are, to do it. Yes, exactly. I, I would say it's the latter. I would say it's the moving barriers. And, and, and you know, there, there definitely are some situations in which i mean i think it, it's interesting i think sometimes when girls don't feel like they can play that's also a barrier like that or like uh, i don't mm-hmm. you know because it's it's that's it that's something that you know they sometimes may have internalized about who can and can't be an athlete and i'm not talking just about soccer but just in general about you know who who, who does get to you know who why there may not be you know, why there may not be, you, you hold a practice and you have an amazing coach and, and if a small number of girls comes, I would say that can, even that of itself is a barrier, that sense of that self-perception of who gets to be an athlete, you know? Right. Um, but, but certainly, I mean, certainly it, it, it's, it requires a lot of patience, you know, it requires a lot of patience and, um, and, you know, some of the most inspiring, you know, um, the, the work that we do internationally, uh, in particular in ground in Nicaragua, that that's a program that's only a girls program. And it's mm. truly amazing to see it's an all female staff. Now, most of them are alumni of the program and oh, okay. it's the, you know, it's one of the only places in the whole country where there's a, a at a, from a young age, you know, from five to six, all the way up through 20 where girls have a chance to, to be able to develop. Um, and when we first started that work in Granada, there was, there was such a small infrastructure for, for girls, for girls soccer. And it has now become just like a truly it's, it's inspiring. So inspiring to me. Like I'm, I, my role now within the organization, I, I don't interact with the programming there that much, but like I, every time I get to, I'm like, Oh, this is like, they're just doing such beautiful work. And um, it's, it's really amazing to see. No, that, that is amazing. And, and I mean, so I don't know if you know a lot about my background, but I coached, um, I introduced the sport of water polo in Afghanistan and then I led their aquatics programs for oh, a amazing. number of years. And, yeah. and the biggest barrier, uh, just like you've interacted with and, and you've dealt with yourself and your staff, um, is, you know, women and girls involvement, right? Not only to get them involved, but also, um, 
for it to become socially acceptable or not even yeah. socially acceptable, just socially tolerated at the beginning. And then maybe at some point socially acceptable. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? What, and it could even be in the U S like some of the things you've already talked about, uh, but also at your other locations outside of the U S what are some of the uh, social and cultural issues uh, that you've come across and how did you navigate them or how are you currently navigating them? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think the, I think what I've seen the biggest challenge being is, you know, I, I think, I don't, I, I think trying to, trying to say this in, in the way that feels right. And I apologize for asking such a difficult question, and, no, and no, especially it's, it's because you're having to, to think about a lot of situations all at the same time i no i just want i just want to phrase it thoughtfully because i think <laughs> sometimes what um i think sometimes what comes across is that there are dads or men who are actively opposed to girls playing and they won't have that and certainly in some cases that's true like there are certainly cases where for example i know my coworker hajar is a former u.s women's national uh, afghan women's national team player and She's described the situation there where it is mm -hmm. actively, there's active opposition in very real and very physical and very stark ways of, that are threatening, harmful, physically, emotionally to, to women there. Um, and that is that has not been the experience that I have had in the, in the U.S. programs or in Nicaragua or in Uganda, where it's not necessarily like an actively hostile um, kind of kind of feeling towards participation from most from mm -hmm. most people it's more so like like it doesn't matter like it's almost like oh, that that's that's not important what's important is you know um it is for for the girls to be home to be helping with those things um i think i definitely see that as as one of the biggest barriers but i think it's a little bit more of more so of an indifference to what types of opportunities girls have in general um whether that's educational or athletic um it's it's more so like there's already operating in an environment of scarcity and there's already not a lot of opportunities in general and therefore like there not being another a, an additional thing there is it's not necessarily like a, i guess i would say people don't seem to think of it as a as a as abnormal and with that in mind then people aren't necessarily going to go out of their way to, to to look to connect girls to those types of opportunities or to create those type of opportunities because it's sort of seen as something that's um you know something that's just the way it is um so i guess that's how i would answer that question i i, I think you know there there have obviously been certain situations in which there has been much more active opposition from parents and girls having to really push back and um, you know, how do we, how do we honor what the family wants while also believing that the girl should be able to play? And those, those conversations are very, I think, case by case. And we really try to be sensitive, but ultimately end up on the side of wanting, you know, supporting the girl to play. Um, and, and, you know, those are very time intensive situations. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess, I think, I think it's, it's often, more nuanced than just everything is, you know, actively against the girls playing. It, it seems mm -hmm. to me to be more that there's, there's just few resources and few sense it, like there's not the sense that this matters. And what I think once people, I think that's what's super inspiring is when you see, Oh, when you see the benefit and when you see the girls really enjoying it and we see female coaches out there and see female directors and you start to see, Oh, this actually, is really exciting. I have definitely seen communities rally around that and, and kind of get mm -hmm. behind that. I think we're seeing that with the Women's World Cup, you know, um, just how this last Women's World Cup was so, um, people really rallied behind that in such a big way. Um, and I think people started to see how much it matters, at, not just within the, not just within the level of, um, you know, the athletes, but at the level of society. I think you start to see that same thing. I I'd be curious to hear if that was your experience. And with the, with the work in, in Afghanistan, but once people do start to see, oh, this means a lot to, to the, to the girls and to the players, then, um, you know, 
that can be a really exciting mindset shift. No, exactly. And I think, you know, once parents see um, what their kids in general, and it doesn't even have to be a girl or a boy, but like uh, once they see what their kids are doing and and they become proud of their kids, um, I think eliminates a lot of the learned behavior, you know, as a child when they were growing up or, or as an adult of, of what their world should look like. And I, and I think there becomes a lot of changes, uh, you know, from the family structure itself. And then I think it slowly expands into the community. Yeah, that definitely resonates with me. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So we've talked about a lot today. I mean, we really have, um, if there was something that you could say to any athlete, coach, supporting staff, high performance directors, the athlete support structure, whether in youth sports, rec sports, high school, collegiate, uh, or even at, you know, the Olympic and professional levels, uh, what would you have to say to them? Uh, I think f for me, I, I would, I would bring it back to who, who's not in the room, like who, who's not having the opportunity to do this. Um, because I think especially, um, especially right now, there are, are, are a lot of young people and, and other people who don't get the same opportunities that, you know, that, that many athletes get. And I really think that that question of like, whatever it is that you're doing at whatever level, to what extent can we can we change what we're doing to be more inclusive because for two reasons one because being more inclusive is beneficial for the people who are then get to be part of what's happening and two because when you're making your organization more inclusive it becomes a more thoughtful and intentional space no matter what because you have to start looking at things about well okay well why aren't people feeling included to be here? Well, is there something going on with the way that we're, we're implementing um, our programming? Is there something about um, who, uh, you know, who's running the program in such a way that, that doesn't feel, doesn't feel welcoming to others. So mm -hmm. I guess that would be a question that I would just encourage people within the sports world at all levels to ask, um, because I, I really do think that, um, it makes it makes you be more thoughtful in how you're approaching your work and when you are able to like i, I think the best iterations of soccer without borders programs i think any person from any identity anywhere in the world would feel welcome and that's such a beautiful thing um and i'm and i i would i think that's a that's a hard that's a hard place to get to you know um and so um, but I think, I think what that means is that we, for all the people who do come, we end up running a really high quality, intentional program. And that's something I'm, I feel, I feel really, really proud of that we've been able to, to do that to an extent. Not that, you know, every single, you know, again, this is the best iteration of it, but I think, I think that that's what we're striving towards. And so I guess that, that's, that would be a question that I would encourage people to ask. Ben is one of the finalists for the Culture and Sports' 2023 Sports Leader of the Year. Please vote for him at cultureandsports.com and click Sports Leader of the Year. And that's a wrap for this week's episode of the Culture and Sports Podcast. We hope that this episode has started an internal dialogue, or even one with your team, about the importance of leadership and organizational culture. If you'd like to learn more about Culture and Sports, the Culture and Sports Podcast, or other programs, go to cultureandsports.com where there is a wealth of resources, articles, research, podcasts, video shows, webinars, and courses. And don't forget to connect with us on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, and LinkedIn at Culture and Sports, and on Twitter at Culture in Sport. Thank you for tuning in to the Culture and Sports podcast.